Thank you for being here. I'm excited to worship with you this morning. We do have a few announcements. Uh, the first is that there is a confirmation parent meeting uh, following the service today. It should only take about 15 minutes or so, but if you have a child that'll be confirmation age and starting confirmation, I would like you to please be there. Uh, September 1st, uh, Paul and Becky Abel will be visiting and speaking at the Antonagon Church. And uh, church service, you said, starts at 9, is that right? Yeah, so if you guys would like to visit that church and, and visit and see Paul and Becky Abel, uh, they'll be there during that service. So, uh, church picnic on September 8th. September 8th is actually a really big Sunday for us. It's Rally Sunday, so Sunday school starts that uh, and our fall schedule kicks off. But we also have the church picnic following, and then also younger youth at, 8, uh, at 3, 3 p.m. is also on that day. So, uh, we want to say thank you, Deb Jokey, for... Uh, your service in providing and ordering and putting the altar flowers on, up. We thank you for doing that. Um, but she will be stepping down from that responsibility, and so we need somebody else to step into that responsibility. So if you think you would like to be the person to uh, order the flowers and then make sure that they get changed when they need to be changed, please contact uh, somebody in leadership uh, or Deb herself uh, in order to figure out what that takes and, and go on from that. Uh, also, adult Sunday school, because our fall schedule will kick off, adult Sunday school will be starting again up on September 11th. There will be a 12.30 class and a 6.30 class. Bible study. Bible. Bible study, what did I say? That's what I meant, Bible study. We, we could do two Sunday school days. All right, uh, any other announcements that need to be made that I did not make? All right, we begin our service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we'll call our ushers forward uh, for our morning offering. Please rise. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for every good and perfect gift that comes down from you, Father of lights. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bless both gift and giver and use this to further your kingdom, Lord Jesus. We uh, pray that you would bless this service and bless our time together. In your precious name, amen. Please be seated. We'll call on the praise team at this time. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just wanted to give you an announcement about Praise Team. We are doing kind of a informal meeting today after church at some point to kind of 
go over music for the next couple months. So if you haven't been involved with Praise Team and want to be involved with Praise Team, come to that meeting. It's not super like official. It's just like kind of getting things rolling so that we're a little more organized in the coming months. So if everybody would bow in uh, for a word of prayer real quick. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this time that we can worship you and bring glorious sounds to you. May we use this time and our voices to praise you and to put our eyes on you and you alone. We are nothing without you and let our music truly glorify you and bring honor and glory to your name. Amen. Yeah. Hey. 
Let us join our hearts together now in confession of sin found on the screen and in the bulletin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Take a few moments now, please, in time of silent confession. If this be your sincere confession, and if with penitent hearts you earnestly desire the forgiveness of your sins, for the sake of Jesus Christ, God, according to his promise, forgives you all your sins, and by the authority of God's word and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I can declare to you that God, through his grace, has forgiven all your sins. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll call on the lector at this time. Good morning. Uh, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, we thank you again for another day where we get to gather together here in your house and to worship you in spirit and in truth. And as we have gathered this morning, Father, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that we might see your words and take them to heart. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to pastor and in preparation of the message that we are to receive this morning. Be with him to stand courageously upon your word, and may we have our hearts open to receive the message. We pray these things in your blessed and holy name. Amen. If you would please stand. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Isaiah. Uh, chapter 29, verses 11 through 19, reading in Jesus' name. And the visions of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, Read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, Read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are still far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder. And their wisdom of these wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who would hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who says, who sees us? Who knows us? You turn these things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay? And the thing made should say of its maker, He did not make me. Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, He has no understanding. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall see or shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In the day that deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness their eyes of the blind shall see, the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. Here ends the reading. Our epistle lesson comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. Again, reading in Jesus' name. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and, his, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, 
So also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you who loves his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Here ends the reading. We would now join together with me in corporate confession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, and the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Children at this time for the children's All right. We should have gave this to you to play. Did you ever? Did you ever hear Peg Top? Did you ever hear about them? So I'm, I'm talking about this this group that was a Christian band that right about the time that I was in Bible college. They, they played at Promise Keepers, and somebody from the AFLC ran into them, and they ended up coming and playing at, um, in Fergus Falls at one of the, their youth rallies, and I happened to be there and helping. And the drummer had a drum kit that he made himself, and it was like a barrel that he filled with, I don't know, blankets or pillows, and then he, his, his, the snare drum was a a lunchbox, and anyway, it was, it was one of the coolest things, and the, the lead singer played guitar, and he, and he sang harmonica at the same time, so he had one of those cool things around his neck, the whole harmonica. Anyway, okay, let's get back to the children's message. As I open, <laughs> that's funny, James. That's really funny. Okay, so James, we, James picked the, my little pony box, and then James picked the, my little pony pony. And I'm not... This has got a magnet on its foot. It's not very powerful, but you can feel that it's kind of sticking on there. Okay, so uh, even though it's not a great representation, but you know what? We got to stick to Jesus, right? You see how this My Little Pony is sticking to the, mail, to the box, mailbox, to the lunchbox, and, and it's because of the magnet. It would be even better if every one of the feet had magnet on it, right? But the, the, the thing is, is that we need to stick to Jesus like that. We have to stay close to him. You know, when, what, what it seems like that I've learned in my life is that the more often I don't rely on Jesus and I rely on myself, the further I get from him, right? The further I get from him. And, and sometimes uh, you, you can't hear the voice as well, right? When I was a kid, there was a, a train track that drove 
was behind our houses, near our houses. And every time the train would come, you could hear it, right? And you could hear it coming from a long ways away. And we were kids, we would, we'd get up onto the train track and then we would listen with our ear on the metal and try to see if the train was coming because you couldn't see it. But sometimes you could hear it coming on the metal before it was coming. Well, when we find ourselves off track, right? And all of a sudden we're way out in the middle of the field and we don't know where we are, it's hard to realize what God wants us to do. And so when we say things like stay near the cross, cling to Jesus, abide in Christ, that's what we're meaning. We're meaning don't rely in your own understanding. Don't rely in the things that you think you know, or even the traditions, unless traditions of people, of men, of humans, are founded by the word of God. And in the word of God, even those traditions shouldn't be placed above the word of God. The thing that needs to be placed the highest in our life is the word of God, right? And so we need to cling to Christ. We need to stick to Jesus. That's what we have to do. Like a My Little Pony with a My Little Pony box, we need to stick to Jesus, all right? Good one, James. Arms out. Mm. What? Way out. Get it, get it, way out. Oh, there, okay. Arms together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for your love. And thank you that the ability to stick to you isn't even something that we have, but that you give. Cling us to you, Lord Jesus. Drag us to you. Keep us near the cross, Lord Jesus. May we never know a day apart from you. In your holy and precious name, amen. All right. Would you like to do it next week, Zachary? Well, yeah, but I also have a lizard that's dead. A lizard that's dead? Yeah, a oh, man. I am sorry about that. Which box would you like to take with you? So you're gonna, what you're going to do is you're going to go home, you're going to take the box, and you're going to put something in it. You want this one? You're going to put something in it, and then you're going to bring it next week, okay? All right, you guys can go have a seat. Just don't bring the lizard. That would be a tough one.
Today's text comes from Mark. It's chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. Reading then verses 1 through 13. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have, re- which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups and pitchers, copper vessels and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. And he said to them, you all too well, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you, might have received from me is Corbain, that is, a gift to God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. Lord Jesus, please speak. Far from it that I have any ability, Lord Jesus, in me to present and give your word effectively. Only only you can do such a thing. Only you bring life and blessing. Only your word, Lord Jesus, spoken by you will do. May your spirit be active, Lord Jesus. May it be mighty. Fill this place. It is welcome here, Lord Jesus, and we need you the Spirit and the Father so desperate. In this moment now, Jesus, be glorified. Amen. Scripture says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But how often is it that we allow that to be the thing that drives us. When, when we think of, of what we fear most, what is it that you, that you think of? When you, when you have things that, that unsettle you, that cause you to question or just make you unable to sleep at night, what is it that you fear? For years in my Christian life, I feared failure. I feared it the most. I would constantly feel like I was failing. And and it felt like no matter what I tried to accomplish, no matter how hard I worked, no matter how hard I tried to be a father, no matter how hard I tried to be a husband, it seemed like every time I turned around, I found fault in myself, in what I was doing. And in that way, I could never find satisfaction, right? And, and, And... I think for men, it's hard for me to speak how women would feel, but I know for men, I think we also seek significance, right? I mean, at least I know that's something that I struggled with. I wanted to be the best at whatever I did. I wanted to be the best at my job. I wanted to be the one who who, uh, excelled at everything that they did. I always wanted to be, and, and part of that, I think, not only is it significant, but in some ways for me, I wanted to be the one in the light. Which is kind of odd because 
for a while, early on, when I was in Bible college, I felt the call to ministry, and I decided not to, to go. And part of it was because I feared that I wanted to do it because I wanted to be the one rather than be the one who was giving. I wanted to be the one seen. I wanted to be the one up front that everybody appreciated. And I still kind of struggle with that sometimes, right? Because I need affirmation as a person, but at the same time, I fear it because I don't want to be the one who gets praised. I want Jesus to be the one who gets praised. But in all of that, what is it that we fear that motivates us? I don't know about you, but I, I remember having a dream one time. I was sleeping because I was dreaming. And yeah. And I was, I was in the front of our house and, and there was a driveway and it was kind of sloped and we lived on a corner. And James and John were playing in the front uh, driveway. And their ball ran into the road and James and John ran after it, and James was running first, and a car came around the corner, and I woke up right when, you know, I didn't see the accident happen, but I, I remembered that kind of thing is fearful, right? And I'm not saying we shouldn't fear losing someone, but that can be something that drives us, right? Fear of losing, whether it's a loved one, whether it's our things that we've accumulated in our life, when you work hard for something, a good, a car, a house, and something bad happens, you can fear that, right? That's something that drives us sometimes. Well, the thing that drove the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the thing that had become the Jewish leaders' thing that drove them was their traditions that they created. They feared for themselves at the beginning. I think that they, they feared God to some extent. But what they did is, the, is they made everything that they did part of that then. And so then what they wanted was that significance of being the one who did all the things and look at me. And the fear of the Lord stopped driving them. They come and they question, they, they came from Jerusalem. This is where we start to see some of the fact that they're, they're beginning to seek him out, right? They're looking for fault. They have fault already. It isn't to the point now where they want to kill him yet. It's very close. It's getting there. So they've come to Jerusalem. They see him and they're looking. They're waiting. Watch him mess up. And once he makes a mistake, then we're going to pounce. Okay, so here... The disciples eat with unwashed hands. And it's not, I want you to understand, when they begin to talk about the washing here, it's not like hygiene, like, uh, you know, it's not cups and dishes full of grime that they're just continually reusing. It's not like, you know, when we go to the bathroom and then we wash our hands after so we don't get sickness. It's, it's not that kind of washing. Their washing was, was a religious washing that by doing so, cleansed them spiritually. They believed that it cleansed them spiritually. And they also believed that if you didn't do that and then you touched somebody else, you could transfer that uncleanliness to somebody else. Can you imagine? How many of us, out of spite, would purposefully not spiritually wash our hands and go around touching people? Like, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? But this is the thing that they believed. So they believed that this tradition of washing was important, and it was important for their spiritual health, and they noticed that the disciples didn't wash their hands. And, and they questioned Jesus. Why is it that uh, you're, you're disciples, you're Jewish, and you're not following the customs of, of the fathers? You're not doing the things that you should be doing. Isn't that kind of where it starts? What do I mean by that? When we start to look at other people before we look at God, then that all of a sudden become a problem, doesn't it? When we stop looking at the cross and we start looking at ourselves, that usually becomes a problem. 
When we stop looking at the cross and we start looking at somebody else and then we apply the law to them but not us, that becomes part of the problem, doesn't it? So here they, they notice the disciples not doing the traditions. And Jesus says to them then in verse 6, Well did Isaiah prophesy of, your hypocr- of you hypocrites. As it is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Mm. I think that, that a lot of mainstream Christianity falls into this right here. And I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I fall into this right here. I want to honor God all day long with my word. How, how many of us do this? I'm praying for you. I'll pray for you. We honor you with our lip, but do we actually spend the time in the prayer? I'm guilty of doing that. Are we just lip service? Are we all about what we say we will do? But when it comes time to actually doing the thing, we won't do it. Or we put something else as more important. And that's what they were doing here. Jesus is saying, you say these things. You honor God with your lips. But when it comes to where the rubber meets the road, you're not there. You're not there. Reminds me of Matthew 7, 21. Many of you say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many things and wonders in your name? And Jesus looks at them and he says, depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Have we become a society that fears man's opinion more than God's? Do you know what the biggest, the largest occupation sought by young adults and young Americans is today? Influencer. They want to be internet famous. They want to influence. Because that's what we need, right? We need more people that know less because they're young and don't know Jesus to influence. We need more of that. I'm telling you, it's interesting how many times you can watch a video of somebody who starts to talk and is trying to influence and teach something that is absolutely common sense. That you're like, wow, thank you. (laughs) The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What is it that's driving us? And what is it that causes us to fear the Lord? Do you think we just wake up and all of a sudden fear God? And do we actually fear him now? Have we lost the preaching and the teaching of the word of God that says, guess what? Today, he could do that if he wanted to. And he would not only could he do it in power, in might, but he would be justified. Nobody likes to realize that. I'm I'm a good person. Well, you think you're a good person in your own eyes. But you also know your heart. And guess who knows it better? That's right. God knows it better. In vain you've worshipped me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In our homes, we teach our children not only common sense things, but right and wrong. You know, I don't, wash your hands, put the toilet seat up and down after you go to the bathroom. I have to do that one a lot because I got more boys in my home. I say that, okay, I'm gonna, yeah. 
But, but do we spend as much time teaching, teaching the important things in our home that go beyond the traditions of man? Do we teach the things of God that if aren't taught, how do we know? We need more than just our moral compass. We need to hear the law and the gospel in its fullness from the word of God. We need that present in our homes, in our life. We need it above our doors. We need it on our mirrors. We need it everywhere to be reminded constantly, day in and day out, who Christ is. And in relation, who we are. The depravity of man is rich. But grace is richer. He explains what he means in an example. Verse 10, for Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. So we understand that, that commandment, honor your father and your mother. And, and without getting into, and I, and I will in a second, without getting into what they were doing wrong, what is it that we do wrong? When it, when it comes to honoring our father and our mother, it's pretty easy to recognize and to see that if we look, that we don't do that well. Some of us do it better than others, but I'm sure there's places where we failed it. I wondered sometimes, when I talk about my mother, who had me at a young age, who struggled in growing up, who made terrible decisions, who I saw, saw be promiscuous, who I saw do drugs, who I saw sell drugs, who I saw... Uh, there was a part of her that was wonderful. She loved every person, and it didn't matter who you were, your status. She would friend you, and she would kid with you. But sometimes she would kid to the point where it was more kidding than being serious, and there were times to be an adult and not a child, and, and she struggled in some of those things. I wondered sometimes whenever I would talk about the hurt and the pain that I had in my childhood, how she would feel. Because even though I struggled with my mother, I struggled with, with how many times she would make bad choices and stupid excuses and, and all kinds of things, I, I should honor her. Because above all, she was 16 when she had me and she made the choice to keep me. And for that very fact, I know I don't honor her enough. And if you're sitting in here and your, your mother and your father are still alive, I tell you, honor them. Because one day they won't be, and maybe you'll want to honor them then, and you won't be able to. not to their face anyway. Well, so what happens here is instead of honoring their father and their mother, mother, they honor their tradition. And one of the things that they could do is that they could they claim the right of Cobain. And what that was, was that thing became a, a gift of God. And they would use that as an excuse for different things. And in this particular case, if you didn't want to take care of your father and your mother, they get old and they need to be cared for, they could give to God the gift of whatever it was and it would be considered a gift and no longer did they have to give any of that to their parent. No longer did they have to take care of financially the burden because everything that they had was a gift to God. But they still got the profit from it but they didn't have the responsibility then. So in other words, what they did is they used the law of men, their own righteous, their own righteous law, they used it to, to not have to follow God's law. Do you think when God looks at that, he goes, oh, that's okay. Yeah, good job. No. There's one thing we can't do. 
If you get nothing else from today, from this message at all, if you get nothing else, will you please hear this? You cannot escape God's law. You cannot weasel your way out of it. There is no way around it. You are dead in your trespasses. And as a dead person, you've got nothing. That's it. One year at Fly, I heard the most memorable thing that I will use over and over. It's not mine. I didn't think of it. It's Pastor Dana Coyles was in his message. He talked about the safest place in a fire, in a forest fire. Where's the safest place where it's already been burned? That's the safest place. It can't be burnt again. Christ is the only safe space in the rage of God's justification, in the rage of God's justice. Christ is the only safe space. Why? Because it's already been burned. It's already been paid for. That's the only place. And if you're in the woods and that fire's coming, are you going to fear it? If you don't, you're going to pay. So if you understand that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, what does that mean? Cling to the cross. Stay in the cross. Stay where it's been paid for. That's the only thing that matters. No man of God or no man of men, no will of man, no law of man. Man, hopefully I get this right. Nothing you can follow that is made by man, tradition, rule, anything can fix that. If we think it's bad and we fear the laws of men, which we should abide, imagine how much worse it will be in the law of God. The only thing you can do is stay where, stay where the cross has paid for it for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us. Help us to not make void the things you've done by our unbelief, by placing the traditions of man above your word. May it be your will is accomplished in this church, Lord Jesus, and in our lives, in our families. May we know your love to the fullest. May we abide in you. May we stand before you holy and blameless in your love. Love us, O oh Lord. And may we love you. In your name, Jesus, amen. Would you please rise? Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.